Dr. Andrew McLaren. I'm one of the uh, ICU doctors here at uh, Nanaimo Regional General Hospital. And my name is Dave Lampron. I'm the Director for Technology and Able Learning with the Faculty of Medicine at UBC. My name is Martha McLeod and I'm Chair of Nursing at the University of Northern British Columbia. My name is Mary Bennett. I'm an intensive care physician here in the PICU at BC Children's Hospital and I'm also the Medical Director of the Simulation Program and building this new simulation centre that we're filming in at present. The unique part of this project is it's uh, giving us the opportunity for the first time here in the North to integrate uh, simulation technology into the curriculum of both the uh, medical school and the nursing school. So there's a lot of sound pollution in this room and a part of that is, I mean it's all manufactured. This is uh, from a compressed air tank, this is from a speaker set, it's from a speaker in the head as well as speakers down there. All the alarms are going, this is all accurate, you know, this is what you'd experience if you're in an emergency department and a super sick guy came in, you would have noise pollution from air moving, from suction devices from the patient themselves, and then you add to this another six to ten people in this room. Some of that is operational talk and some of it's just crosstalk. This is wearing, and that's why it is such a challenging environment to, uh, to perform things correctly in, perform well, and it's the same environment that we should be practicing in so that you can try to filter some of this stuff out and concentrate on things that are important and make smart decisions in your team. So some some residents came into residency being really comfortable with emergencies and really comfortable with acute care and I, I wasn't one of those people and, and so the first time I the first time I came in here I tried my best to avoid having to do anything. Um, but they don't really let you. They they don't really let you do that. And for me, it was, despite the fact that it's not real, it's really terrifying because you sort of project it into your mind as okay, you know, what would I do if this was real? So if we've done it in the sim room and you've done it with the simulated patient, then when you see it in real life, you can be more prepared for it, have a little bit of confidence that you do know what to do here because you've done it before. Simulation allows us to do something very important. Uh, Nowadays we have many more learners, we have much, many less patients, the, the atmosphere is much more charged in terms of making mistakes, and simulation allows us to practice, really practice to be perfect, before we actually have patient encounters. Essentially uh, it's a way of bridging that performance gap between our theoretical knowledge and our actual clinical practice. The word simulation is really sort of an omnibus description for a bunch of different activities that, that fit on a spectrum. Um, so simulation could be uh, as rudimentary as, as using a banana to practice um, suturing for the first time. Simulation can also be creating web-based cases that get the learner thinking critically to build their, their clinical reasoning. And then at the furthest end of the spectrum in this facility, I think is a, an excellent example of it is, is what we would call high fidelity. We can target almost any kind of learner. So within the medical field, we anything from medical students through to residents through to postgraduate fellows and subspecialty training. Um, so medical learners of all levels, and then also for continuing medical education. For example, I taught a pediatric emergency course a couple of weeks ago, and we do it completely on high fidelity simulators. So physicians from smaller towns, smaller communities, can come in and practice pediatric procedures on small people, which they will probably not get a chance to do very often in their normal life. All of these groups um, want to train with uh, an interdisciplinary format, so they don't want to train as uh, five pediatrics nurses. They want uh, that pediatrician in there, they want some residents in there, uh, and the paramedics. As you may be aware, the Northern Health Authority spreads itself over an area roughly the size of France, and we can't bring everybody uh, to Prince George, it was just being impractical. Um, so we've been very lucky in, in terms of managing to get resources to, to provide simulation in a number of centres. What did the doctors and nurses need? Where do we need the um, 
the limbs? Where do we need the shoulders? Where do we need the lower and medium fidelity simulation? And where do we need the high fidelity simulation to meet the needs of the learners in those situations? And that we have a, a wider range and better used simulation centers across the North. And so what's happening in BC right now is that we're getting lots of different organizations um, coming to the table interested in sharing um, lessons learned and sharing experiences uh, and sharing resources. The Simulation Technology Working Group or the STWG is a working group that was spawned from a larger, more strategic working group that had been struck by the Vice Provost of Health, who's also the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine. Essentially devising a strategy for the province around how we can enable simulation in health professions education. Um, somebody would raise their hand saying that, well, I'm building a new simulation facility in Fort St. John. How do I go about designing it? So for somebody like me who's kind of come to simulation um, by learning about it from other people, the working group is a very powerful thing. You can get on the phone and people are sharing their experiences and if you've got a question you can ask. And is really, at this point in time, I think the only place where um, conversations are happening that are sort of cross-regional and interjurisdictional. The first place that we started was developing guidelines around facility development. So what are some of the considerations if you were designing a room like, like this? Well, what kind of requirements um, does simulation have in terms of debriefing and what sort of technologies could best, best facilitate that function? And we're also discussing joint procurement. So how do we leverage off of the, the essentially the buying horsepower of the province rather than sort of have each sort of individual organization um, purchase on their own? It's always useful to collaborate. And I think that's one of the things we have to learn in medicine. We're no longer lone wolves in any area. Collaboration, collaboration in research and education in clinical is just top of the heap. And why shouldn't it be in simulation as well? So it's a perfect place where we've been able to meet and create something different and better than any one of us could have done before.